in 2017, there were 33,438 farms in New York State, with 6.8 million acres of arable land under production, according to the USDA Agriculture Census. This equates to roughly 20% of the state's land area. Still, we must ask, how effective is their supply of goods? And if they do, are there any difficulties in the process? What are the challenges they face? Stay tuned as we explore deeper into the topic. To begin, let's look at an overview of the subject. Dairy and milk production account for nearly 26,000 jobs in New York State, followed by grain, corn, and hay for livestock feed. Cattle farming, which appears to be in the province of Nebraska, is prevalent enough here to rank fourth. Then there are apple orchards, most notably in the Hudson Valley. In the winter, the twisted, contorting, scraggly branches make the ideal scare tree for nervous nighttime strollers. With over 40 varieties, New York has the second largest apple harvest in the United States. Cideries abound. Vegetable farming is further down the top 10, with cabbage, sweet corn, potatoes, and tomatoes harvested in such large quantities that they are mentioned here. However, they are outmatched by Florida culture or flower farming. In New York State, the minimum wage for farm laborers is mandated at $14.20. As a result, markets must compete with cheaper produce flooding in from neighboring states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, which pay their labor less. Because of the North American Free Trade Agreement, Canadian produce is also in the competitive mix. Even Mexico, whose labor costs must be low to offset transportation costs, undercuts the local product and price. Because interstate commerce law prohibits any tariff on out-of-state produce, New York farmers are forced to circle the wagons and be content to tout the value of buying local. Some who prioritize local quality practice organic farming and avoid genetically modified crops. As a result, their crops are more vulnerable to the whims of weather and insects. Moving on, what do we know about the nervous crop? Delaney Taliaferro, a blueberry farmer whose family has been in the business for two generations, says, my season is winding down. The Taliaferro farm is located in the town of New Paltz. In addition, we have our strawberry patch over there. We also did some melons. This year's melons were not a particularly good crop for us. To put it another way, the melon harvest was extremely fruitful. Simply put, we did not plant as many as we should have. Accurately forecasting the weather is as important to a successful harvest as good luck is to a casino gambler. If you lick your finger and stick it in the wind for three months, you should be able to predict which direction the wind will blow. A long row of greens that have yet to be picked can be seen from a long distance away. That's Romanesco, cauliflower, broccoli, and kale, Talia Farrow says as she goes down the list. According to Talia Farrow, these are the toughest of greens. He further said, the foods covered in the following section are beets and spinach. Another vegetable whose leaves I'll begin to cover today is arugula, brassicas. The Talia Farrow farm is unhappy with the unusually warm weather occurring recently. We already had a frost, she says. That sort of thing confuses a crop. Apples that ripen and fall too early. A nervous crop. Broccoli is ever ready to bolt. Following that, Davenport. Been there, done that. Bruce Davenport of Stone Ridge's Davenport Farms has been in the business for 40 years. Sweet corn is the cash crop in this area. As far as that goes, vegetable farms are so low on the totem pole that we get no help from the government at all, Davenport says. The USDA has programs that help vegetable farms if you fit into certain small groups. For example, we get subsidized for putting cover crops on our land after we finish farming it, which is helpful. However, because it's so small, it does not fit into our business plan. We're grateful for it because it allows us to take better care of our soil. But what the government gives us amounts to some tax breaks because of our agricultural land. Cover crops are planted in the off-season to help manage soil erosion. They may also have the effect of replenishing nutrients depleted by the cash crop. Consider nitrogen. There is also an agricultural exemption for farmland, Davenport explains. There are very specific parameters, and if you're actually farming and making a living off farming, that's not a big hoop to jump through. And yes, it reduces your school taxes. Next up, more specifics on Davenport report, been there, done that. Davenport is concerned about the state labor commissioner's recent changes to overtime laws for farm labor, which have reduced the threshold from 60 to 40 hours per week for when overtime pay kicks in. Davenport said, they effectively reimburse us for overtime over 40 hours, but less than 60. According to my understanding, they must approve this reimbursement every year, and that will most likely be pulled out from under us somewhere down the road. As a result, we'll have to pay it back. If we have to continue paying overtime and not getting reimbursed for vegetable farms, you're going out of business. The changes will be implemented gradually over the next 10 years. In the meantime, the state government is footing the bill. Davenport is correct that future legislatures must approve the amount of money allocated in the bill. Davenport is a fourth-generation farmer who has dabbled with crop changes in search of a more profitable harvest. Been there, done that, Davenport says. We grew a lot of hemp for CBD. That did not go as planned. You have to stick to
to what you know. We have what some people call ancestral knowledge because my grandfather and father did this. We're also pretty good at what we do and switching is fine for someone who is just starting. However, all of our equipment and knowledge is geared toward vegetables. It's difficult to get a crop of tomatoes, corn, or cantaloupes off the ground unless you know what you're doing. Moving on. Hepworth. Take care of the earth. Down Route 9W into Milton, a seventh generation family farm has expanded into growing cannabis alongside more traditional crops. I'm very aware of food and agriculture and feeding people. Amy Hepworth, pomologist and Hepworth Operations Most Green Thumb, explains. Hepworth further stated, the work required to address the Green Revolution's transformation to a more biological, sustainable, and regenerative agriculture. It's not an easy fix. It's a spectrum. There are numerous steps along the way. The Green Revolution, to which Hepworth refers, was a period in agriculture that began at the end of the 1960s, was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, was pushed by government initiatives, and was characterized by mechanization and chemical fertilizers to prevent millions from going hungry. Large-scale, high-yield agriculture. I'm giving you the farm's history so you can understand how we got here, Hepworth says. We transitioned from the conventional diverse market, wholesale, retail, complicated, cooperative marketing, in ways that adapted the family to what was different at the time and allowed us to move forward. The way we serve people's basic needs is so economically disproportionate that it tells the story of the ruin of a culture, where wealth is practically distributed. People must return to abundant consciousness because we are in such a state of deprivation while living in such abundance. And how do you make them feel it? Following that, more specifics on Hepworth's claim, take care of the earth. Other farmers are hesitant to discuss politics. Hepworth, not so much. I'm not a party person and I don't care, Hepworth says. However, having someone listen to you is a fantastic experience. Metzger, Delgado, and Hinchy are the ones I know, and they've impressed me with their ongoing efforts to support agriculture. By understanding and listening to farmers, they have aided our farm. The hungry attention of a populace whose appetite has been awakened for quality, chemical-free local produce is approaching a tipping point, while policies at the state level are coming into agreement with demand at the local level. You're investing in an agricultural system that costs more money to do it regenerative and to care for the earth for those who haven't been born, Hepworth says. Finally, small-scale farming? The soil beneath the feet of Hudson family farmers is shifting rapidly as the market shifts away from large-scale farming. New policies to support small-scale, sustainable agriculture may become the norm, as they have in the past. I like small-scale farming, Talia Farrow says. I think a lot of big farmers are scared of it because they're wondering, what are these people doing? What does this mean? Because they manufacture in large quantities, so they've planted, you know, acres upon acres of tomatoes and apples and the like, which I believe we should still have. But I also like the European market style, where a lot of families own smaller farms and then go in every single day. Like, that's where people shop. They don't go to the grocery store. Well, that marks the end of our video for today. We hope you enjoyed it. On your way out, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.